If you ask any professional investor what they're looking at right now, they're probably going to say oil. And why wouldn't they? It tends to move in times like this. But what they really should be looking at is yields. The bond market is telling us everything we need to know right now. So as we enter into OPEX and look ahead into Max Payne, let's talk about the week we just had and the week ahead. Hello everybody, welcome to the Daily Recap Show where we talk about stocks and the financial markets. My name is Chase. If you like this video, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, let's get into it. And we officially finished green for the week. Energy put out an exceptional day as well as utilities, but they were heavily sold off. Banks outperform in terms of their earnings and finish red on the day. We'll get to them in a second. And another one was consumer cyclicals. This was very interesting indeed because BOFA came out with retail sales data, thinking that retail sales are going to be in the last quarter. Other than that, we saw selling in this section of healthcare as well, but it was very 50 50 trade throughout the day. So, guys, I put this on Twitter with regards to financials and healthcare or United Health, since they were the only healthcare provider reporting. I said both are up 15% from their lows, strongest sectors year to date. They kick off earnings on Friday unless impressive EPS beats, expect some buy the rumor, sell the news type of price action and that's exactly what we saw. Have a look at this right here. IWM has a lot of regional banks. They popped on the JPM news and a lot of financials reported great earnings. But if you dive in a bit deeper, it wasn't as good as it all seemed, especially with the forward guidance. They were all sold off significantly with the only winners today being the uh, S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now moving on to the best performing sectors and really energy outperformed as well as materials. But it was very flip floppy trade. I mean, industrials, financials, healthcare, semiconductors lost, uh, software, staples, technology as a whole were up. It was very, very 50. There was no rhyme or reason to today's trade. But the Bitcoin ETF skies day two down 12% in just two days of trade. Sell the news. Talk about selling the news. And sure, maybe it'll rebound. But this is kind of crazy price action. I mean, those who bought on the day of issue are down significantly. And let's move on to sentiment. This BOFA bull bear indicator, a very, very good indicator. I mean, right here, it was in the buy section on the October low. We're now sitting kind of in the middle, a little bit right to the middle. And then we have the Goldman Sachs sentiment indicator, stretch positioning right here, extremely light right here. We're kind of sitting in the middle, call it neutral, and we're neutral on both indicators. And what is this telling us? It means probably the sentiment right now is just hold. If you're in any type of position, just hold what you have in your portfolio. Now, looking at the week ahead, we're moving into OPEX. Expiration is on Wednesday and Vanna and Charm flows are actually coming to an end. These dealer supportive flows are coming to an end after Wednesday, after OPEX on Friday. And then we're going to move into the seasonal period where we could see some weakness. And we're going to talk about some short opportunities a little later. But let's actually look at the stats. This is the S&P 500 performance on OPEX day, the week of OPEX and the week after. And you can generally see that the week after OPEX, which we call the window of weakness, is generally a negative period in January. The week of OPEX is also generally a weak week, but the actual OPEX day is relatively flat, although still marginally red. And I'm willing to put money on the fact that these losses right here will come either on Thursday or Friday, one of those two days of trade. I think Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday will be fairly positive. And then after expiration, that's when we're really going to see selling come into the market. Now, looking at jobless claims data, guys, we totally missed this yesterday. So initial jobless claims came in at 202. Continuing claims was a beat as well. And it's really hard to look at these numbers as anything but positive. I mean, we're sitting better than the COVID averages. I mean, continuing claims are lower. Jobless claims are lower. It's really hard to look at this data as negative. Something to be aware of next week, continuing claims, I feel is going to jump to the 1900 plus region just because of seasonal adjustments. Now we got PPI data and it was very, very cool. PPI X food and, and energy year over year was at 1.8. We were expecting 1.9. And then the month over month figure was 0%. We were expecting a plus 0.2%. The prior month was zero. And it was very, very cool. And this sent yields lower. I mean, excluding the 30 year, the longer end, we saw the two year and the 10 year as well as the bills, that area of the curve really move significantly low. And I do think that this is going to continue. I think we're finally going to see the US two year get to that 4% region. And we're going to see a 
aggressive selling, aggressive bearishness in the yield of the two year. Now we are sitting right here in terms of the soft landing, higher for longer or recession camp. And this is the softest landing the market is actually currently pricing in. This is where we are in the 10 year. This is where we are in the S&P 500. And if we get any softer, we're gonna move up to this area right here. Now guys, let's talk about bank earnings. We had the majors, United Health, Bank of America, JP Morgan, and BlackRock all post EPS beats compared to what was expected. But why did they sell off intraday? Well, United Health sold off because of healthcare costs and what they flagged coming into Q1 this year, Q2, the exact same thing with Bank of America. BlackRock saw dramatically less flows. I mean, we were expecting something like $10 billion of inflows for the quarter. We got something like 9.5. It was significantly less than what was expected. And then JP Morgan, I think as a whole, just because of the flows, they got put in there. But Jamie Dimon did come out and say there is some soft saying the consumer is strong. But looking at Q2, Q3, we are expecting weakness because of the lagged effects of rates on bank revenues. And according to this data and what uh, Dimon said, they are set to intensify. And it's just something we have to be wary of because something that we also saw with FactSet after the report yesterday, FactSet came out and said, financials are now actually gonna have a decrease of earnings as a whole, negative 11.5%. We're actually gonna report negative earnings for Q4 2023 compared to what we were expecting of 1.3% earnings growth. So guys, we really do need to keep our eye on what earnings is going to do this quarter and next quarter. Now let's switch gears and talk about investor flows. $182 billion has been put into money market funds in the first two weeks of the year, outpacing almost every single year since 07. And investors are still liking the 4 to 5% yields they're getting on their money markets. And along with this, we can see that households are sitting on $18 trillion in cash, equity and mutual funds are sitting on a lot of cash and private equity dry powder is sitting at two trillion dollars and here are the stats for when investors normally start deploying money into the market so normally you see investors sell stock once cash reaches 4.5 percent you can see it right here and you can see it right here something very interesting when we got to 4.5 percent right here investors did sell 100 percent as you can see but we're still on a net net positive and if this goes down we could see further acceleration into equities breaking that all-time high barrier in February, March, later on in this year. Now, where is a good place to start putting your money, especially as rate cuts are imminent? Well, one place is Japan. Japan is looking very, very attractive. Look at this equity risk premium right here, 6.3%. And this is essentially the extra premium you get on top of the risk-free premium. You're getting paid 6.3% to hold equities in Japan compared to the 1% in the United States. Furthermore, central bank is doing QE, upward of 6% of GDP very very interesting now that is japan let's have a look at the u.s now the united states spx spw the spw is the equal weight sitting at 16 times multiple the market cap weighted sitting at a 20 times and looking at the sectors as a whole the actual pe of the s p 500 is 19.8 the cheapest sectors on a pe basis is actually energy and financials but on a price to earnings growth it's actually information technology and communication services so these are sectors you can look at if you're looking for growth but something really interesting the price to earnings growth for energy is at 202 that must be a mistake the free cash flow yield is at 10 percent incredibly interesting stuff right there so if you do want growth look at information technology com services if you're looking for value probably energy financials and then everything in between and here is the valuation for small caps the russell 2000 price to book ratio is sitting at two historically below the average and just above the one standard standard deviation. Now looking at small caps, you can see here that low valuations and a healthy GDP outlook signals upside for small caps. And we are expecting about 2 to 3% GDP growth, depending on your source. Goldman Sachs is expecting 2% growth for the year. And you can see that the modeled returns is 15% for small caps looking into 2024. Now small caps are the worst performing sector year to date but we still have the entire year to play out. And one thing I also wanna show you is that small caps tend to be stocks with lower margins. Now, low margin stocks are currently trading at an historically large valuation discount compared to stuff like high returns on capital and companies with a strong balance sheet. And what we can see in this graph right here is that weak pricing power stocks typically outperform when margins improve. So small caps typically outperform when margins improve. And we can see on this graph right here that analysts are penciling the lowest margins since Q4 of 
for 2020 for the S&P 500, but that is expected to change. And this would likely follow small caps in expanding their margins purely because we're going to see rate cuts and a stronger consumer throughout 2024. This is a good sign for the broader market as a whole. Now diving into seasonality guys, and we got some presidential year seasonality. Now in a presidential year, when the S&P 500 has been up 20% or more, the next year has always been positive. This has happened. This has happened nine times and the subsequent returns are very, very positive. An average return of 13.4% up 100% guys. Very, very interesting. And here are the stats all in aggregate, not looking at an election year. Now let's talk about gamma. Guys, there isn't much to say. It's the same old story. We see quite a bit of call gamma rolling off, especially as we get to OPEX. And we do see quite a lot of negative gamma inserting right here, especially at this strike. That's very, very interesting. But we also did see call gamma at the 4,800 strike slightly increase but all in all, it does seem like the tides are shifting in terms of the amount of positive gamma on the tape versus the amount of negative gamma. That being said, everything is still in the favor of positive gamma, and that means buy dips, sell rips. Looking at the gamma heat map, and this is exactly what I mean, you could see that there is definitely negative gamma coming into the tape. This was the dealer exposure heat map, and around the 720, 460, 80 level, there's a strong, strong pull of negative gamma, something we haven't seen come into the market in the last eight to 12 weeks. And there's also a lot of negative gamma building right here. All in aggregate, there is quite strong amounts of positive gamma, but something to be wary, especially as we go into OPEX, options expiry, expiration, And looking at positioning, something we're also seeing coming into the tape is this right here. It puts being bought, puts being sold at aggressive levels, especially below the 4,700 strikes, 4,680 strikes, 4,720 strikes, right here at 4,760, well below current spot price. And I think what these are is just tail hedges. They're tail hedges coming into expiration, coming into OPEX. Looking at charts, and this is what I see for the next two to three weeks up until the end of January. This right here, the 4575 area, this high volume shelf, where this high volume shelf starts, this is going to be a very, very key support zone. So if we start selling off, and I do think we're going to start selling off after Wednesday, I think we're going to see some weakness come into the market. I'm just looking at the market internals, right? The advanced decline lines, the overboard conditions. I think we're probably going to see some form of selling come after Friday towards the end of January. And if we can hold above this line, 4575, I think we probably go higher to February, make a higher high, make a lower high. But if we do break this right here, we're probably going to sell down right to the 4,400, maybe even the 4,300 level. But I'll keep you guys updated on a week to week basis. We're sitting well at the highs right now, and there's no reason to aggressively hedge into anything. Just something I want to point out right there. We'll take this day by day. So something I got my hands on and something I thought I'd show you is BOFA Global's research technical analysis on the majors in the United States. Now, why is this important? Because institutional clients are looking at this. This BOFA research goes for anywhere from like 10 to 100K per year. And this is what a lot of the big boys, the big players, the big fundies are looking at, you know, when to buy, when to sell. And what they're looking at in the NASDAQ 100 is that a breakout from the early 2022 to 23 cup and handle pattern suggests more upside for the NASDAQ. They have a measured move from 19,500 all the way to 21,200. I would personally would say the, the measured the breakout starts right there if it does break out but what they have is this right here and again the big boys are looking at this this cup and handle we've broken above and this is what they're expecting 21,200 and that's about a 20% upside for the Nasdaq from where it currently is and I do think that this probably validates itself as long as we stay above this 1443 level so we could probably see some sell side here before see some upside into the Nasdaq. And this seems very logical based on what I'm thinking. Now let's have a look at the Dow Jones, very similar situation. They see potential upside to the, uh, you know, 39,300 to 42,600. They've built a multi-year base right here. We've broken above this trend line and that's where the measured move takes us. Looking at the Russell 2000, bit of a different story. They think that the Russell 2000 failed to hold its breakout from a big base and needs to defend its weekly moving average. So right here, if we stay above here and continue, that could be seen as continuation. So we come down, up, 
up, up, up, up. Obviously, maybe there's more volatility, but if we do go below here, that's gonna spell trouble. And maybe we go back down to this level right there. Looking at the S&P 500, and I'm gonna read it straight from up here for you guys. The S&P 500 broke out above resistance at 45.95 to 46.37 in December to complete a big base going back to early 2024. Upside counts to 5,200 and 5,600. The rising 40 week moving average near 4,400 and the rising 200 MA near 4,000 reflects the cyclical and secular bullish trends respectively that underpins a positive technical setup. Very similar to what we're seeing in the NASDAQ, a cup and handle situation situation you could say we've broken above and a measured move takes us to between 42 to 5600 and I do agree but maybe we see a pullback first before we go into higher price action. Now guys, here is both the secular and cyclical trends. Now in 2024, the SPX will enter the 11th year of its cyclical bull market. Now the reason why it's at the 11th year is because this right here was 2000 to 2008. We made a high in 2000, came down, then made it all the way to pretty much the highs, came all the way down. This was the GFC. And then when we broke above this high convincingly, the 2013 breakout. And so we are in the 10th year of the secular bull market and what we're seeing during COVID and the last drawdown was just cyclical bear market, cyclical trends with inside the massive bull market. And we normally see this here, 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 inside these secular bulls right here, here, and here. What they say is the current secular bull market from the 2013 breakout above the prior highs from 2000 to 07 is middle-aged and can last until the early 2020s and early 2030s. And from what I've charted, I'm thinking 2033, that's probably where we go to. Every single bull market has lasted 26 years. We are in year 10, some would say 11, which means about 12 more years from 2024. Let's take away two years as a margin of safety. That would take us to about 2033 to 2034, call it 2033. And that's why I see that. So based on outcomes and history, we can expect higher price action in the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ. Now here is every S&P 500 cyclical bull market compared to what we're doing right now. So you see this right here. So this right here is 2013 when we had our secular bull market breakout. And this is where we are right now. You can see that this is the 1950 to 1966 bull market and this blue line is the bull market from 1980 to 2000 and in both instances we probably go higher and we're actually tracking this bull market really really well i mean there were times when we diverged from it all in all we've sort of come back into fashion where we are right now and we can expect higher price action especially on a longer term basis and if you've got 10 years in mind you know buy the s p 500 buy the nasdaq i do expect higher prices two, three, four, five, six years into the future. Now guys, there's data up in the week ahead. We have quite a lot of data, but the big ones are gonna be focused on retail sales, industrial production, and housing starts. But if you've made it up until here, guys, thank you so much for watching. Guys, please subscribe, hit the notification bell, like this video, and leave a comment. Cheers.